Jeff. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank all of you for being change agents. And I'm uh, uh, going to take this opportunity to talk about how we can unite technology and science to promote change. And I'm going to, of course, have the traditional IBM legal disclaimer. <laughs> you can read it. If you'd like me to read it, I'm happy to read it. <laughs> now let's, uh, <laughs> let's move on. So, uh, so I, uh, I have to admit, coming to IBM, being at IBM now for almost seven years is not what I thought uh, I would, where I'd be. Uh, and the way I like to put it simply is that I basically am doing public health in the private sector. And so, but my journey didn't start with IBM. It didn't start thinking I'd be at IBM as their chief medical officer. It started actually in federally qualified health centers in DC and Baltimore after my residency in internal medicine and peds where I was in settings that were really challenging and serving underserved communities, immigrants, migrants, uh, low income, uninsured, and a broad diversity of populations. And often <laughs> being that, uh, that sometimes the rare Asian American physician in those settings, <laughs> speaking some Spanish and, and really loving my job, loving the diversity that I saw. But as I reflect on my current role at IBM and my, when I came out of residency working in those underserved settings as the National Health Service Corps Scholar, I think about the challenges that I had with time. You know, you only have those 15 minutes per patient. The fact that so many of those patients had limited English proficiency. The fact that I was using language line. The fact that I only had seven minutes really with a patient and to address all their broad range of problems and issues. The fact that there's so much stuff in a medical record, there's so much information and so many challenges. The fact that I had to keep up to date with all the knowledge to take care of kids and adults, to look at those journals, those textbooks. So as I think about what I faced then, I think about what I'm trying to help support people like all of you now, and including a lot of my colleagues who are still in those federally qualified health centers is a big data challenge. How do we bring a technology like Watson, like AI, to support you in the front lines as you address these broad big data challenges? This is my federal portrait. <laughs> so as I transition, and it was, it, was an e it was a relatively easy transition in terms of not having to move, to go from working in federally qualified health centers in DC and Baltimore, and then working at NIH on health disparities, uh, having really the good fortune of the Recovery Act, having the Affordable Care Act, having an opportunity where the country was very focused on ways in which we could provide expanded access, the ways in which we could serve those populations that I had the privilege of serving on the front lines and with so many colleagues who are still there and so committed. So I think about actually in terms of my federal role, the challenges I had in terms of keeping track of the traditional evidence, the stuff you would find in books and textbooks. I went to the Kennedy School of Government and you know, there's lots of policy, there's a science of policy making and there's a lot of opportunities to leverage that science. But then there's the real world evidence, there's the reality which often doesn't mimic what's in the books or what you read. And so how can you bring all that information and data to policy makers so they can make better decisions. And so that's another big data challenge that I'd like to highlight. So as I think about now at IBM and being a part of a company that's been around 110 years, calling itself international business machines, think about that, 100 years ago. I mean, it's very relevant today. And so I think about my role as a public health professional, as a global health professional, and I think about the role IBM has played in these different eras of computing. And this era of computing of AI and cognitive is incredibly relevant to you now and in the future. And, it's, and we're not, there's no turning back. If you look at this, and I just want to reflect on how we've played a role in helping with these different eras. So I'm going to reflect on one era, which is the era of the programmable systems era, which is all the computers you have today. Do people like watching movies? Raise your hands. All right, anyone seen Hidden Figures? All right, that's a great movie. Isn't that a great movie? That was the first movie I took my daughters to, with, which wasn't a cartoon. <laughs> they loved it. Um, and so 
I just want to show you, there was a role in, of IBM and computers in that movie, and I do believe there's a lot of opportunities as we think about the, about the future. So here it is. What's it going to take to make this thing worth the price tag? Well, we're just getting up to speed here, Mr. Harrison. I need more manpower. I need programmers, folks to feed the cars. Yeah, we'll get them for crying out loud. OK. All right. You're the IBM man, right? Yes, sir. Well, we'll pull them out of the sky if you have to. Understood. I'm not paying any of you. When the first IBM came to NASA, Yay! it was not a, an easy transition. No one thought to measure these things? I'm afraid not, sir. Nobody knew how to use it. Computers were these big units that took up the whole entire wall. There's more computing power in a toaster today than what was available to these people in the 1960s. When Dorothy sees the IBM being built, she learns how to program them. She realized really quickly that the IBM was going to be the wave of the future. The IBM 7090 data processing system. It has the ability to solve problems that cannot be solved in a lifetime of manual labor. Hit it, girl. What's your name again? Dorothy Vaughn. We need the IBM for Glenn's launch. We got a job to do. Whatever happens up there, it's in God's hands. My gals are ready. They can do the work. Ladies, we've been reassigned. She basically saved her whole team's jobs and created a value for herself. It's so funny what we think of as computers now and what they were then. All right, so as you think about the hidden figures that played a role there, I'd say this new era of computing is about hidden data. It's about the recognition that all the data you have, whatever organization you're a part of, whatever government you're a part of, whatever private sector component you're a part of, is a natural resource. And that data has a role. And if you think of an individual, you think about all types of data. And one of the things you learn very quickly serving underserved communities in DC and Baltimore, and with all the knowledge you thought you had accumulated, the residency, the training, the books, the journals, is that you recognize that determinants of health are so much broader than just healthcare. That in many ways, it's, healthcare is only 10% of the determinants of health. And that's why so many of us are struggling, because so much of our investment is in healthcare dollars and not in these broader public health dollars. And so I think about the determinants in terms of one, two, three, and four. 10% healthcare, 20% genomics, 30% social and environmental, and 40% behavioral. And so obviously place matters. So many other factors play a role in healthcare. We need to bring that big data together from the silos that exist. We need to bring the variety of those data sets together. And obviously it's challenging because some people view data as their own. And ultimately, that data is that patient's data or that citizen's data. It's not you know, some other entity's data. It is about bringing the volume of that data together. Typically, we like to say there's about 300 million books worth of data that each of us will produce in our lifetime, whether it's that data that's social, environmental, genomic, behavioral, as well as clinical. And you have to bring the velocity of that data. If you think about data these days, while the average person only engages with healthcare maybe once a month, whether it's getting a prescription, seeing a doctor, getting a lab test, we engage with data now with mobile phones every day. There's a velocity of data with wearables, and there's an opportunity to bring those data sets together with the appropriate consent and privacy protections and permissions with the appropriate persons to bring those silos together. It is also about the veracity of that data. So much of that data is junk. If you have data that goes in that's bad, you'll have bad insights. So that's important to filter that data. And then ultimately, that data needs to bring value. And that's where the insights are important. And it needs to bring value from a perspective of different stakeholders. So providers, I like to call the seven Ps. So you have to realize all the stakeholders in health have their own perspective of what's important. And so in order to bring people to the table, you have to understand, seek to understand to be understood. So providers are key. Payers are key. Health plans are key. They're a key part of the equation. Purchasers, employers have an amazing role to play. They're policymakers. Where you work, you spend most of your time there outside of your home. 
That's where policies can be made. Then, of course, the broad policymakers, the governmental entities, whether they're state, local, or federal. There's also product manufacturers, medical device companies, pharma companies. All these entities play a big role in health and healthcare. And then the pioneers, and I view this group especially around, of course, areas like governmental public health or nonprofit, but really you are pioneers. As I looked at this conference, as I looked at the people who are participating, I'm like, that's, that's my folks. You know, this is why I want to be here with you, because I feel that energy of change. I feel that energy of catalyzing something that's new and disruptive. And that's what you're doing here today and what you do back in your homes, in your workplaces. And then ultimately, you have to think about patients within the context of a family. So part of what I'm trying to tell you, if you think about it, have you ever heard of the, uh, the metaphor of the blind man and the elephant? Every person, every one of those blind men think the elephant's something else. Some of them might think it's a hose. Some of them might think it's a broom. Some of them might think it's a tree trunk. We have to realize this $3 trillion industry in the US, $8 trillion globally, people have their own perspectives of what they view as value of how they view that data that they have. Somehow we have to bring those pieces together to take a better understanding of that broader elephant, to understand the challenges we have because ultimately it's bankrupting our society and we're not getting the insights we need with the, and the value that we need. So as you think about the choices you have to make, these are the choices I wanna highlight. You have to think about the content. Once again, going back to data as a natural resource. What am I going to do with the data that I have that's unique to me, that someone has trusted me, my patients or my, the people I serve have trusted me with some element of their data? That is knowledge. That's a natural resource. Who am I going to collaborate with in the community? How am I going to bring my data potentially to that table, BYOD, in the right appropriate way and bring those collaborations across different sectors? How am I going to potentially put that data on a cloud? Where am I going to trust that data and store it to assume there's privacy protection, security protections for that data? But I also want to highlight millennials think about data much differently. They think about it from a philanthropic perspective. How can we empower people? Like, I, I love the, this idea. Look, what can I donate? What am I a donor? An organ donor. What if I decided I want to date, instead of just donating my organs when I pass, maybe I want to donate my data while I'm alive. Maybe I want to play a role in a, in a protected way of supporting cancer research or some other. My, my, you know, my daughter's got asthma. My dad has AFib. Maybe they will make choices or I can make a choice on behalf of my daughter that I will donate her data and her asthma condition issues to some broader purpose for researchers to help advance knowledge in that space. So how can we think about data privacy and data philanthropy? And that cloud plays an important role, where it's stored, how it's trusted. Then how do you use technology and machine learning to get insights out of that data? And then this is the last piece where I'm gonna transition now from the technology to the science. It's also about the evidence. And I saw this frequently. And we will continue to be faced with this challenge where people will say, Show me the evidence of what you're doing and its effectiveness, okay? So on this note, I want to highlight that when it comes to this issue of cognitive, I'm going to show one quick demo about it. It is about a system that isn't programmed. It understands. It can go through structured and unstructured data. Think about all the data sets that are not structured, pros, medical records, records of people, that's in unstructured ways. It can learn that data. It can reason with that data. And it can empower humans to get insights out of that data, to translate that big data into key insights. It is about man or woman plus machine, this idea of what are we good at. And there are so many times that I see as a physician where I'm like scanning for things, I'm searching for things, I'm looking for knowledge in different places. I'm almost like a typist sometimes. And this point here is there are things that are computers are good at, leverage the computers for that, and there are things that humans are good at, leverage it for, leverage it for compassion, for generalizations, for abstract thinking, for building that relationship, the compassion. 
So how can we leverage what these systems are and how they can complement each other and provide augmented intelligence? So I'm gonna just show you a quick demo, which is look, this is the power of cognitive, which is in over 150 hospital systems across the country, across the globe, in China, where you, you, in China, India, Thailand, Mongolia, Brazil, Mexico, Eastern Europe, and basically on the left, there was a medical record. And then you can look at the different patients, and a system like Watson can read those medical records, that structured and unstructured data, understand with it, reason, learn it, and then find information connected to medical literature, to medical textbooks, medical journals, and find recommendations to help that cancer patient make a better, hopeful decision. So that, that, that decision is made between a doctor and a patient using this augmented intelligence to help supplement that, that, that decision-making process. So this is an example of cognitive system, and it's transparent. It links to the literature. So just imagine of the data you have, the way you can apply this in the work you do, all that natural resource, how could you use a system like this to hopefully make better decisions? And so now I'm gonna to transition to the science. And here's where I wanna highlight that we're gonna have this opportunity to leverage a system like that to bring insights in a way that are gonna be differentiating and different than what we've done in the past to do these three Ps of this cognitive error, to predict better, to personalize better, to promote health. And so let me go into a couple examples. And these are publications that we've applied and looked at in terms of being able to better predict risk. So when I, I was at Upper Cardoza, and you were working in Unity Healthcare in these underserved populations, and you would see a lot of intimate partner violence, or you'd see a lot of domestic violence, you'd see a lot of vicarious traumatization, you see a broad range of issues, and like I said, you had those seven minutes. So here's an example of using mining of electronic medical record data. There's actually 14 million lives worth of data that were looked at, and it saw correlations in about 3,500 factors or symptoms that frankly a human can't look through all that data, and found correlations about what were more likely amongst those who had been identified as victims of domestic violence. And so these were the other characteristics that were found. Now these are things that are intuitive, but once again, showing the evidence that of course, you're more likely to have acute injuries. You're more likely to have PTSD or cardiovascular problems. You're more likely to have uterine rupture or, 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 or fetal death or uh, prematurity you're more likely to have depression and anxiety disorder. These are all things that now help us potentially better think and maybe better detect people who are victims of domestic violence. Once again, leveraging the data and the evidence. And this type of knowledge can help prevent misdiagnosis and it can also help identify the right treatments, improve screening. Also, in, the, in that Unity setting, we, I mean, Unity does a lot in prison health, and there were a lot of pe folks I had who had been incarcerated and then were re-entered into the community, and I knew they had broad issues, and, and oftentimes it was substance abuse or mental health issues, and connecting data sets from the criminal justice system, the variety of data, with the healthcare system, and looking at insights that connect the two, and applying machine learning to better predict who's more likely to get reincarcerated. And who's more likely to get reincarcerated if their substance abuse issues or their mental health issues aren't addressed? So this is just another example where it was applied. And this is initial stages, but the ability to predict at 67% accuracy who's at higher risk and leveraging those systems to better predict so that I, as a clinician, those seven minutes can maybe think, I got to be more focused on this person because they're at potentially higher risk. So I really have to be careful about making sure we address their substance abuse and mental health issues so that they don't get down a path of potentially being reincarcerated. The other idea of personalization as you go to, from prediction. Now, medical devices, so this is type 1 diabetics or glucometers. Using that data with other data sets together, we were able to predict people at risk of hypoglycemia which is, if you're thinking about type 1 diabetes, one of the worst things that a parent or a patient can endure is a low blood sugar, 
potentially lead to coma and potentially to death. So predicting and personalizing those interventions before you get a hypoglycemic episode in you know, nearly a quarter of individuals with those types of insights is also very important. And this we did with Medtronic. So once again, leveraging big data, providing some cognitive capabilities, and then better predicting and personalizing interventions. Now this one, look, in the area of cancer, and I've had um, family members who have faced cancer, prostate, breast, and, and obviously as a physician I have, it is one of the toughest, one in two men, one in three women will get cancer in their lifetime. The challenges, and you heard Greg Simon talking about the cancer moonshot, there's huge opportunities to leverage cognitive computing and AI to help better personalize treatments. So in this case, we applied cognitive computing to the, all these broad data sets, once again, all that big data, all that knowledge, and found within three minutes, we could assess a recommendation, provide it to a molecular tumor board, and looking retrospectively at over 1,000 patients, 99% of the time, what the AI system recommended was concordant, concordant with what that group of oncologists recommended. But in a third of cases, there was a study or treatment that was found that was completely relevant for them to consider. Once again, it's humanly impossible, even for a group of oncologists, to keep track of all that information. So this is an example of better personalizing interventions with this type of tool and making sense out of that big data. The last piece I'm gonna highlight here, and look, when I am um, working my first job at Unity Healthcare, I loved having the uh, WIC, Women, and Infants, and Children, on the fourth floor. I loved going up there knowing as a pediatrician that uh, you, know, you had all those services that supported breastfeeding, nutrition, making sure you had a healthy pregnancy. And so here's a basic thought. How, where's the proof that shows that WIC improves birth outcomes? So here's an example of leveraging data from a broad range of data from WIC clinics in California and healthcare data showing that actually there was a significant correlation between WIC enrollment and participation and the reduction of preterm birth, low birth weight, and perinatal death. I mean, this is an example of applying analytics and big data and insights to show that evidence that's important for policymakers as they make important decisions about where they allocate those limited resources. So this is another study that I thought was important. And then the last study I'm gonna reference here is the work we're trying to do now. So in this area of behavior change, there is an effort to look at, it's called the Human Behavior Change Project, which is applying machine learning and AI to all that literature that exists out there to see through that structured and unstructured data what are the different interventions that seem to be effective? And how can we create a, a, a learning knowledge system that can help support that? And answer that basic question, what behavior change interventions work, how well, in what setting, and for what behaviors and why? So the last thing I'm gonna highlight is this area of AI, which some people have, I, I like to say Star Trek AI, you know, um, Spock. Um, I like to reference those examples because we are in a big moment here where where this new era of computing is going to go is going to be determined by how the people in this room face it, talk about it, confront it, set policies for it. So we've always stated that the purpose is to support humans, not replace them. It is about augmented intelligence, not replaced intelligence. And so that's important. It is also about transparency. It is a glass box, not a black box. It is important that we recognize we need to know how these systems are trained, what data it's using, what biases exist in that data and that literature, and that literature and those biases have to be up front and center. And lastly, it will change how we view big data. It will change, I believe data scientists will be a big part of the team. I believe that there'll be a huge role for an AI-supported system in making important decisions for all those key stakeholders that I referenced, from providers to patients. So we've got to think about how these skills are going to change how we address the work that we do. So the last quote is, look, we've got this over at, in, in our Watson Health headquarters. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. So I look forward to partnering with you to invent, inventing that future. Thank you very much.